Friends, let's bow together in prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, faithful God, take the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts and make them acceptable in your sight, who alone is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dr. Hollinger, uh, Dr. Huffman, members of the trustees, faculty, parents, friends, families, spouses, glad we recognized spouses a few moments ago. I wouldn't be here were it not for my faithful spouse over these years. Students, graduates, congratulations for reaching this wonderful point and for this opportunity to share this moment with you. It's an enormous privilege. It brings tears to my eyes, and you'll have to excuse me if sometime during the message this morning I break out myself as I think about what it was like to be in your position all these years ago. In fact, it was 44 years, it's unbelievable, since I came to Gordon Conwell, 41 since I graduated, and Katie has spoken about faithfulness. Over these years, I want to attest to you that when you leave this place, God will be faithful to you through the years. does not guarantee the kind of path that God will lead you on, but God is the Good Shepherd, and God will lead. It's the most remarkable thing to be able to live our lives knowing that God will lead and has plans and purposes for us that in God's time, in God's way, God will fulfill. I want to speak this morning a little bit about your future, to reminisce a little bit about uh, my past. Some of you, as we've already heard, you know what you're doing, where you're going, or you think you know what you're doing and where you're going. And some of you have no clue what you're doing or where you're going. You're just a little bit less certain. 41 years ago at this time, my wife and I knew that we were going north. We were going north to Canada. We were going north to a very small church in northern Canada, some 800 miles northeast of Montreal. I know some of you come from sunny climates. If you think Boston is cold, it is nothing compared to Labrador in Canada where we went to an iron ore mining town called Wabush. It's across the Quebec border in the region known as Labrador. It's part of the province of Newfoundland. There were no roads into this community, which your graduates now, you will realize there were no roads out either from, from there. Uh, you could fly planes in, 737s could fly in, there was a full airport there, and then there was a train designed to carry iron ore down to the St. Lawrence River, and passengers could come on that train as well, kind of as uh, the cargo, the extra cargo there, and on a 12-hour train ride down to um, a place called Sedil. But there we were, we had worked summers in the Canadian Presbyterian Church. I'm a Presbyterian, we'd worked summers in the Canadian Church, and we wanted to serve in the Canadian Church, and we thought we were going to Nova Scotia in the Maritime Provinces, but I received a phone call in March on a Friday evening from the Board of Home Missions. And the person calling up said, um, you know, uh, I know you thought you were going to Nova Scotia, but the church we wanted to send you has been taken by somebody else. Uh, we have something else for you to consider. There is a small congregation, it's one of our two frontier congregations in Canada, which has had five pastors in five years. And if we cannot find a pastor to go there, this small congregation will close. Uh, we haven't been able to find anyone yet, would you consider going? So this is a Friday evening, I, I said. Well. Not exactly what we had in mind. Uh, how long do we have to think about this? He said, well, our meetings are over on Monday morning at about 10 o'clock in the morning. So we had two days in order to think about our future there. And we began to pray uh, deeply. We began to talk to friends. And in particular, we began to talk to some of our professors, Drs. Gwyn and Mayor Walters. We talked to, and some of you on the faculty know Dean Nigel Kerr, and uh, we spoke to them at length. They gave us a day, and we talked about what God wanted to do with our lives in general and this particular call in particular. They were not just professors to us. They were brothers and sisters in Christ, 
And we had this sense that they cared deeply about our lives and about the effectiveness of our ministry in the years ahead. Gordon Conwell is not merely a school of divinity, an academic institution, though it is. It is a seminary which prepares you for life in the service of God in the church, and that's what it was to me and always has been. And I trust you know what a gift you have been given by God to be here with this faculty, caring for you, both with your mind, your heart, and with your lives. So we made our decision, and on the Monday morning, with trepidation, we said, we will go. And we went for two years. We stayed for five years. And in those years, God took my education here. In those days, you weren't speaking about formation. You were really just speaking about education. Took my education here. And in those five years, I learned how to be a pastor, learned how to be a preacher, and I learned how to be a community builder as well. Pastor, a preacher, and a community builder. I knew stuff in my head about all these things, but had to learn it with my hands and with my feet in those particular years. And a thousand bits and pieces of everything else that's involved in the ministry. Some of you are here with D-Mins. You're coming from that experience. You know what I'm talking about here. But we had to learn this by doing and not just by thinking and reading and blend together what I received in this place. In those years, two lessons stand out that I want to share with you today. The first was this that if you love your flock, if you love the people God is sending you to, and some of you may not be going into a church, you may be going into a Christian organization, if you love your colleagues and the people that that organization is serving, if you love them, then you will succeed. Your ministry will bear fruit for God made known in Jesus Christ. One reason you will succeed is that they will forgive you because you will mess up. If you don't love them, they may not forgive you and one thing will lead to another. But if you love them and they know it, if you do not use them to climb the ladder somewhere else, but if you love them, you will succeed. Jesus said this, by this, all people, will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Do you remember when Jesus said that to his disciples? It was actually when they were graduating from seminary. They'd been with Jesus for two and a half years, maybe three years, and they're graduating. And this is his word to them. If you love one another, and then they would remember, love your enemies, love your neighbors, the whole gamut. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. And your word will be effective if you love one another. It's an old statement, but it's worth repeating and perhaps remembering on this day that people do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. If they know you care, they will hear the word. They will hear your life. They will hear your words. And they will respond one way or another to the gospel message that you preach. I learned this in practice, this business of love. Within a year, actually within six months of graduating, I found myself in a terrible mess. Maybe it was my fault. Well, I know some of it was my fault. Maybe it was their fault. I wanted to blame them for everything that had gone wrong. But I rubbed some people the wrong way. I mean, I really did. And I thought all was lost, and I'd blown it. But one day, I found myself visiting a member of my congregation with my wife. My wife, Curry, was with me in the local cottage hospital in this place in the middle of nowhere, 800 miles north of Montreal. Uh, there was a small cottage hospital. There were about 20,000 people in that total area. We found ourselves visiting one of the women in the congregation, and she was about to lose a baby. And she was in a desperate situation. And we spent time with her talking and praying and reading scripture. This particular person was one of my fiercest adversaries in the congregation, was opposed to pretty much everything I wanted to do. 
and I had done some things which perhaps I should not have done. But she said after those visits that she could not have made it if I had not been to her, not her adversary, but her pastor, bringing the word of God, the word of life, the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ into that small place. And from that moment on, instead of being my adversary, she became my biggest advocate. And from that moment on, that unhappy congregation, and it had been unhappy before I arrived there, began to turn around and we saw some Holy Spirit joy in that small place that they had never seen in years. And children began coming. So, a small church, 30 people, 100 children began coming. And my ministry began to develop in unexpected ways. This was a powerful moment of experiencing the power of love in an adversarial situation. Things changed. Love. Love them. Very simple. Jesus says it to those who are graduating. The second thing I want to say is don't quit, but persevere. Stay the course. And this brings us to the passages that we read a few moments ago. Paul speaks very clearly to the Christians in Galatia. He says, don't grow weary in well-doing, for you will reap in due season if you do not lose heart. It's a promise. It's a command. Don't grow weary. Do not grow weary. You will reap in due season if you do not lose heart. People will know you are faithful disciples if you love them, but you will reap if you do not lose heart. This is the message of Paul. It's also, I believe, profoundly the message of our Lord Jesus. And it's a message which is contained within the parable of the sower that I think you probably all know very well indeed. When we read the parable of the sower and seek to understand it, very often we don't read it actually as the parable of the sower. We read it as the parable of the soils. And it's not a bad thing as you leave this place to ask yourself, what kind of soil am I as I leave this place? You probably wouldn't be the soil of the path uh, for the very fact that you are here. The Word of God has taken some root in your life, but you're going to be leaving this cozy environment. And you have to ask yourself, are you like the rocky ground? Did the seed really dig deep, the Word really dig deep in your life? Or when you don't have this support here, who will you be? Make this your prayer, O oh Lord, that is not who I want to be. Or you're going to be in a world filled with distractions, the thorns and the thistles. Lord, Lord, keep me faithful despite the thorns and the thistles. And help me to be good soil so that I bear fruit for you, the fruit of the Spirit within and the fruit of changed lives on the outside. We often read the parable as if it's the parable of the soils, and that's a good way to read it. But I think you also need to read the parable as if it really is the parable of the sower, the parable of the one, as you will be doing, who scatters the seed in one direction or another. And if, in fact, this parable that Jesus teaches in Matthew 13 is the parable of the sower meant as a parable for those who are graduating from seminary and are about to go out and scatter the seed, what Jesus is saying is this, that no matter how good you are, you will face obstacles along the way. This is absolutely inevitable. You will face obstacles along the way. And there are going to be times in which you will want to quit. So Jesus says to his disciples, his followers, in the face of trials and tribulations and obstacles and your own mistakes, do not quit, but keep faithful. Even when you scatter the seed here or there and nothing happens, keep faithful. For as Paul said, you will reap in due season if you do not lose heart. Sometimes I think the better name for this parable would be the parable of the baseball batter. If you bat 250, it's going to be okay. What I mean is this, you may be worn out in the ministry. You may have preached the word faithfully 
and nothing happens. Everybody out there seems like rocky ground. And you say, I don't know why I was called to do this. And Jesus says, don't quit. Keep on going. You may be scattering the seed out there. And there are those who embrace the word for a while. And then they don't. They're no longer there. The ones on whom you want to depend. And you begin to lose heart. And you say, I want to quit. And Jesus says, don't quit. Keep on sowing that seed. You may have had a taste of success. And people you thought were on your side aren't as much into it as you are. And you find you're all alone again. And you're tempted to quit. And Jesus says, don't quit. Because if you keep sowing that seed, eventually you will hit the good soil. And when you hit that good soil, you will see the hand of God in a way that you could not even begin to imagine. You will reap 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. So I mentioned a problem in my early years after seminary in my first church. Not my early years, my first year. Not my first year. Six months after I was in your position. Actually, what happened was this. I told you I rub people the wrong way. I rub people so much the wrong way that in my first congregational meeting, half my small congregation walked out. So I had 34 to begin with, and I managed to get it down to, I was a math major, tell me what that is, half of 34. So I'm down to 17 within six months, and life is miserable, and I'm wondering where God is in the middle of all of this. But my home church was praying for me. And I think that God actually got a group of angels up there to say, listen, I've got somebody down there who needs some special help. And I think they were on my side as well. And the Holy Spirit would not let me forget my call from God. And you must never forget your call from God. And I could not forget those conversations I had with my professors before I left and the guidance they gave. And instead of quitting, we hung in. We hung in long enough to see something small but powerful, an unhappy group of people coming together with a joy that we could not describe in any other way except the work of the Spirit. And the life that those children began to bring to this small church was powerful. We left after five years went back to graduate school. But as I look back on those years, having been in all kinds of different churches and all kinds of different places, what I know is this, that it was there, in those times of difficulty, that I learned to put into practice the things that I learned here, to become a pastor and a preacher and a builder of the community of God a small sign of the kingdom of heaven on earth. And we have been called to be witnesses of that kingdom and God's servants to build that kingdom in whatever branch of the church or place in the world God has called us to serve. In every church of every size, those truths have remained true. If you love them, then you will bear fruit and people will listen to your word. They will know that you are disciples of Jesus Christ, and surely we all want that in our lives. And if we do not lose heart, then we will reap in due season. God will make sure that that happens. And we can trust, as we heard earlier, our faithful God to make that happen. Do not grow weary in well-doing. Don't quit. He will reap in due season. Friends, we are sowers of the word of God. What an enormous privilege it is. What a wonderful day this is to be here together, knowing that this faithful God will lead and guide. Serve him faithfully with your lives. There is no better path in this world to follow than the path set for us by God made known in Jesus Christ. Life is, in some senses, a game. This is the day when you come up to bat. Play ball for the sake and for the glory of God, and God will be faithful to you. God bless you.